Hey, welcome to another in the video of the series of ASP.NET Web Programming. In the end of this video, you should have something that looks similar to this here. We have an application that has several users and the properties that go with them. We're going to display them on a table that's formatted in CSS and working with a little bit of CSS in some of the titles. So that's what's coming up next. So as we left you in the last video, we have a view of a, an amazing story. Very simple text and no formatting. Obviously there's no data either, so there's no users that are showing up on this. So we're going to start from this point here. So at the end of the last video, we had some basic HTML. Now we're going to add some data to our class. So what I want to display on this page is a list of users. And so far we just have a, a model with a single user on it. So we'll go make a list and then we'll be using a list on this page. To make the list, I'm going to go into the test controller. And just before the return view, I'm going to insert some lines. So normally, when you get a list of users, you would get them from an external data source, such as a database. In this demo though, we're going to hard code them in and create the list right here in this class. So the first thing I'm going to do is define a new variable. Let's call it users and it will be a, a list type. Don't forget you need to initialize your variables, so we'll create an empty new list. So when we create a new user, we'll use users.add, and then inside of the parentheses, we'll just create the user inline. So recall that every user has three properties. There'll be a name, and there'll be a phone, and an email address. So for the three strings, I'm going to provide a name, Roger Federer, and I'll make up an email address, Roger at Gmail, and then a fake phone number as well. Let's create some more users. So I will copy and paste the original object that I made and then paste in some new names. So now that I have the users variable defined, it's a list, I can include it now as a second parameter here in the return statement. So let's put in the word users and it will send it to the view as well. And then in the view, we can show it as a table. All right, it's time to switch to the view. Let's see what's going on in the test view. So in the original design for this model, I said I am expecting a model of a user, which is a single user. I'm going to modify that now and change this into a list. So right here at the beginning, let's say list, and then I'll put in the brackets around it. So now we should expect to see not one user, but multiple. So we'll get to the users in a moment, but the first thing I want to show you is some things that are razor related. These are labels. If you're going to work with razor, you always start with an at symbol, and often you use the dot or HTML dot something to add a new component to your page. The simplest component that you can probably come up with is label. So I'm going to select label. Now label is just a tag that shows something that's related to a text field. So let's put two labels on the screen. I'll have one that says, welcome to Razor, and the second one that says, these are my customers. When this renders to the page, we should get pure HTML, but we'll see that there is a label tag hidden in the code. The app is running. I'm at the wrong URL to make this work, so let's delete the word test, and we have a single test. Now you can see that we have welcome to Razor, and these are my customers. It looks like normal text. Let's do a right click and inspect and let's see if there's anything different about these. So I'm going to select the selection arrow, pick the welcome to razor, and you can see that we have label as part of the tags. So labels are associated with controls normally, and in this case, they're just isolated by themselves. Let's put some style on this next. So I want to change the style of this font. I'm going to make it a little larger, maybe change its color. And there are at least two ways that you could do this. One is the inline style, which is the probably not correct way, but we'll do that first. And then we'll add a separate style in this page, which is better. And then if you really wanted to do it right, you would have an external style sheet. So we'll do the first two examples. So to create a new style, you type in the word new and then curly brackets and try to avoid getting the word string. I just want plain brackets. Then I put in the word style equals in quotation marks. 
And everything I put inside the quotation marks will become the style. So this will have all of the styles in one string. For example, if I wanted to have font style of 24, I would put font hyphen style colon 24 semicolon. I want red, so I'll do color colon red. Now there's no typing assistance here in Visual Studio because we're in a string. But I think I got the syntax right. Let's check it out. Once again, I run the application, delete one of the tests, and I get to the correct URL. And now you can see, Welcome to Razor is now printed in red. You notice I forgot something. It says 24, and it didn't pick up the style. So 24px is the correct way. And let's run it again. So this demonstrates one of the disadvantages of having inline uh, styling. There, now I've got it correctly, and it says welcome to Razor in size 24 points, and the uh, style shows up. A much better way to design styles is to create them in the header and then refer to them in the rest of the page. So to create a, a style sheet, you can do it right in the header of the page. So I'll put the style tag and close style tag, and inside I'll create a class for a style. I will call my class label1. So now you can see when I'm typing my style, Visual Studio gives me some assistance to know which tags that I can pick from. So I'll choose font size 24 again. Now as I go through the options, I can see things much more uh, clearly. Instead of just red, the only color that I can seem to remember, I can see that there are dozens of predefined colors. All right, I'll put, I'll put a few more of the styles in. So things such as the font family, I'll change the font weight, and I'll display it as a block. So this will start on a new line. Now down in the code where it says label, I'm going to erase the inline styles that I've created, and I'm going to replace it with something that says at class equals, and then I can put in here the word label one. So now I can refer to this label one style anywhere in the document, and I've only got one definition, uh, and it's the single source of truth for the uh, style. So you can see as I run the application again, the style is applied, and I can get all of the properties with one statement of code. Now I can apply this class to multiple pieces in my page. So let's say I want customers to have the exact same style, so I can now just copy the label one style and duplicate it on the next line. So I can change everything in one place. Let's make this font bigger. Let's go with 36 as the size and run it again. We should get both of them now as the same style. So now you can see that both labels are both chocolate and 36 size and they are on their own separate lines. Let's say I want to create now what's an ID instead of a class. So I'm going to copy and paste label one and change the, uh, the front character from a period to a pound sign. So this will create an ID style. So it'll only be applied to one item on the page instead of multiple. Now CSS allows you to override things. So the most specific is applied first or it gets priority and the least specific style is applied to uh, the style as well. So what's duplicated in here? I'm going to change some font sizes. I'm going to change the color. However, I'm going to leave font family and font weight and display as they were before. So since they are overriding and they are duplicated, I can, I can delete these last three lines in label two. So now you can see that label two is overriding with font size and color. Okay, so now I have a class and an ID that's defined. Let's apply the ID to label number two, or the one that says, these are my customers. So inside of this curly bracket, I'm going to put in the at symbol and tell it the ID is going to be equal to label two. So the second item will have two classes applied, or two styles. First, it will take the class label one, and then the ID function called label two. So it should receive all of the properties here, which are Arial, Bold, and Block. It will also override the first two priorities because uh, 20 and Cornflower Blue are listed as the ID and not in the class. So we're mixing CSS. Hopefully you understand some CSS so this will make sense. If not, 
This is your first introduction to styling with CSS. So now when we run the application, you can see Welcome to Razor, and these are my customers. Both share the Arial font, both share the display block, but they have different sizes and different colors. Lastly, I'm going to add another HTML item. Let's type in the uh, choice called Action Link. So Action Link is an underlying uh, hotspot. Hot uh, it's a clickable link. And so I'll call the uh, text as that refresh this page and refer directly back to this page. So you can see now that the link is on the page. If I choose to refresh this page, it brings it right back to this page. So if you had another page on your, on your website, this was how you could create a link to it. Let's inspect everything just before we're done here and see what the HTML looks like. So an href is the tag that we just created. You can see in the previous two labels, we have a class equals and a ID equals. So that is the HTML code that was generated from our Razor code. In the next video, we're going to actually use this list of customers. So uh, our video is getting a little bit long, so we'll create the table in the next video.